Howdy, I'm Nolan Gray, Research Director at California Yumbi, where we're hard at work making California an affordable place to live, work, and raise a family. Welcome back to Abundance. In this episode, I chat with Henry Graybar. Henry is a journalist at Slate, where he does fantastic writing about cities, zoning reform, Yumbi and housing politics, and he's currently a Loeb Fellow at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. In this episode, we chat about his brand new book, Paved Paradise, How Parking Explains the World. It's a fantastic uh, new book. Strongly encourage you to go pick it up, uh, including topics like why parking drives people uh, insane, uh, the curious case of parking privatization in Chicago, and the future of parking reform going forward, something that we're committed to here at California Yumbi. While I have you here, of course, if you haven't already, take a moment to subscribe and leave a review. It helps us to expand our audience and parking pill more uh, normal people. Uh, so please go do that now. Uh, and also when you leave a review, do tell us if there's anyone you want to hear from in the future, future guests, future topics, you want us to cover more, uh, all of that helps us to build a better product for you with that onto the show. Hey, Henry, uh, welcome to abundance. Great to be chatting. Hi, Nolan. Thanks for having me. Um, we're here to discuss among many other things, uh, your new book, uh, paved paradise, uh, how parking explains everything, right? Did I get that right? The world. The world. Okay. Nothing. So. Nothing outside of this particular planet is concerned. Yes. <laughs> no parking minimums on Mars that we know of. That we until know until Elon. Of. Until Elon gets there. Oh God. Yes. Okay. Um. I mean, it's it's an incredible book, and and just at the outset, I would say, you know, everyone who's even vaguely interested in in cities or or transportation or certainly parking uh, should pick it up. It's it's fantastic. And it, it finally, I think, you know, most of the listeners are probably familiar. Donald shoop has been doing a lot of this work, but I think your book is just so fantastic as an accessible sort of and very funny and interesting uh, survey of parking. I, I want to start things off with something that I, I've been thinking about regularly as a, a reluctant driver in LA. Why does parking break people's brains? Uh, yeah, I mean, people, like a lot of things go wrong in day-to-day -day life, but, but parking really like sets people off, including me. Right. Uh, and I, and I, you share experiences like this in the book. What, what do you think it is about parking that just seems to break people's brain? Yeah. I don't just share those experiences. I have them, Nolan, like even, I mean, I guess you're as well versed in this subject as I am at this point, but I too, uh, really hate showing up, not finding a parking space, don't particularly like paying for parking, hate getting a parking ticket. So I don't consider myself um, above these emotions at all. Um, and so figuring that out, I think there's been a, there's been some uh, introspection as well as some uh, observational reporting. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but when we were, Nolan and I were in Seaside, Florida about um, eight months ago at um, an event that was honoring Donald Shoup, and one of the things I was doing there was making a podcast about parking. Um, and I was going around the parking lots in Seaside, Florida with the microphone, like a like with a nice radio microphone, like interviewing people who were circling. And I would just like stop them, put the wind, put the microphone inside the driver's side window. Excuse me, how long have you been looking for parking? And it was just it's not like 15 minutes just driving around in this tiny little town. Um so I've been thinking a lot about this subject, and I think you know the most basic answer is that we live in a society where people don't really have any other options. And so it doesn't often feel like you made a choice to drive. It feels like you had to drive. And so then when it's difficult to find parking, it, it does feel like a, an infrastructural failure. Um, and, and that can be very frustrating, uh, especially if you need to pee. Um, but there's a couple other things I, I've noticed that I want to draw attention to. Um, one of them is the um, uncertainty of it, because I think this is part of what rankles, right? It's not like you go and you expect to look for five minutes. It's that you never quite know how long you're going to be looking. And I think that uncertainty is part of the irritation. The second thing is that parking isn't included in driving directions. And so you feel like you have a firm estimate of how long it's going to take you to get somewhere. And it's usually really accurate. And then you get there and there's this big margin for error that's been imposed on you by the parking situation. And then um, finally, I think parking is, for most of us, I think probably the moment where we come the closest to damaging our car. And um, I think that's part of it too, because uh, if you find yourself in a kind of thorny parking situation, I think it actually begins to induce a kind of like a, a stress actual reaction related to the fear that you're about to, um, you know, you know, 
scrape some paint off your car trying to get into a tight spot you get people honking behind you etc and so i think there is a sense of um that being the moment where uh, an accident might happen as well yeah well i mean in the book i, I think that's all right and, and you make an interesting point in the book which is that when you're searching for parking like when parking is not available you're kind of trapped in your car right like you, you cannot you literally cannot like exit the vehicle that you have dragged to the location and you're you're you're, you're like you're stuck in a way that like even even in traffic you don't feel like oh i am trapped like you know that feeling of like circling the block I, I had this experience recently visiting a friend in in k-town which is somewhat infamous even by la standards for uh, lack of parking uh or you know there's a lot of parking but it's not priced we'll talk about that in a minute um <clears throat> and there was this feeling of like oh my gosh like i'm i can't get out of my car here in this area i'm like stuck i have to just leave right or i or i can't get out of my car because there's just nowhere to put my car yeah, it is a little, it was a little alarming, right? You you suddenly become a prisoner. I guess you could say it's sort of a metaphor for the car culture in America at large, which is that for many of us, we we really have no choice but to drive, and um, and it's there are many many externalities associated with that situation, but you rarely become as conscious of it, I think, as as when you're looking for a parking space, and and then suddenly it's like, well, I literally can't get out of my car. You know, I think something that really works about your book, and I think is also partly something that that Shoop did very well, is is it's funny, right? I mean, parking is, it's sort of this thing where it's like, you know, I I I, I ta with Shoop the parking class, and it's funny because within our sort of world, right, that's impressive and interesting, and people are like, wow, you, that's a great, you know, that that must be a great class, and then you talk to normal people, and they're like, oh, they have there's a class about parking, uh, right? So you you kind of have to have this like sort of self-effacing approach to it you know like you have to ease people into it but there's a joke that 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 i've heard i, I think it's a, it's in your book you know the, the classic seinfeld joke right where uh they're searching for a parking spot and it's like well why don't you just pay and the joke is you know um you know parking is like sex like why would i pay for it if i if i could just apply myself and get it for free um and it's funny because i feel like this is one of the areas where i um I feel like it's actually changed how I engage with with a city where I, I feel like understanding maybe the time cost of cruising makes me a little bit more sort of open to paying for parking. And it's funny because I I, I noticed this with folks who maybe haven't thought a lot about parking. They really will just they, they will spend, you know, uh, 15 minutes cruising to avoid like a two dollar parking charge uh, or, or, or folks. Another thing, I, sort of parking irrational behavior that I've seen is folks sort of desperate to get a spot at the front of the parking lot and cruising around at the front of the parking lot when it's like, well, if you would just go to the back, like there's plenty of spaces and you're going to walk an additional 30 seconds. What do you, I mean, this is tied in with my first question of irrational anger. What do you think is going on there with folks, you know, sort of not taking the obvious spot that's maybe a slightly further walk or maybe a slightly higher fee? Well, a few things. And I think part of it is that we are, um, notoriously poor uh, at estimating um, the the value of our time. Um, I think that's that's just a, a universal challenge and money is very direct and 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 time feels more abstract. Um, I think uh, people who work um, with their cars and work by the hour have a more um, keen and refined sense of this. If you have to make 100 deliveries and you have to spend 20 minutes looking for a parking spot, that is a significant um, cost of, of for, for you of doing business. And I so I think that's why a lot of those people um, simply park illegally uh, and uh, rack up lots of fines, but, um, but also why they are often um, kind of un- anticipated allies of parking reform. And I think you saw this, um, you've seen this in like loading zone experiments where um, big delivery companies often will sign on because they're excited about not spending all that money um, paying for paying parking fines and also uh, not spending all that time looking for parking spots. Um, I think there is uh, probably something else going on as well, which is that um, many of our urban areas are more populous now um, than they were, uh, let's say, 20 years ago. And um, I know this is, I feel this acutely in, in New York City, which um, which is where I grew up. And New York City has 
gained about a million people in the last 25 or 30 years um, since I was born. And uh, that means that people grew up accustomed to having it easy to find a parking space. And those um, expectations have um, those harden, right? And those become part of the way you think about the search for a parking space. But the urban environment has changed and there's more people, there's more buildings. Uh, competition for street space is um, more intense than it used to be. And all of this adds up to a situation where, um, you know, you might approach a situation, uh, you know, an urban parking situation, thinking that you're going to find a great spot and you just don't, right? And I'm actually, this isn't a problem for me because I grew up in New York and granted New York has gotten worse, but already in the 90s was an extreme, an extreme parking scenario by American standards. And so when I get to a new city, I will take the first parking spot that I find, even if it's like five blocks from where we're actually going. Um, I've been, my, I've been, uh, you know, I, I expect to, parking to be hard to find, and I behave accordingly. And so I do think that those expectations might change at some point. But for the moment, we're dealing with this period of a couple of decades of, you know, lots of urban development, which has, um, you know, changed the way people uh, approach the subject. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I, and I think that's certainly true for folks maybe who are newly minted urbanites, right? I mean, if you're coming from a a context of, you know, parking uh, abundance, so to speak, parking is everywhere and it's free and it's always right next to where you're trying to go. Um, you know, it requires a fundamentally different approach to parking when you're in a city where parking is scarce and uh, costs money and there's other things competing for the land. Um, and I guess that's, I guess that's partly what you're getting at with New York is that New York became more as, as the city fills in, right? You know, we have to do these things that involve prudent parking management that, that, that folks are, you know, a little bit reluctant you know nobody likes to pay for something that they thought they got for free right right uh, well that's that's a huge that's a huge shift and also um at the same time you know so much has changed in in the last couple of decades and yet people expect the parking situation to remain unchanged and the amount they pay for parking to remain unchanged and and all that so i think there's a sense that uh you know change is hard and 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 change in parking seems um especially hard but uh, you know uh, I do think people adapt. And I think that, you know, given, given the right set of incentives and the right circumstances, people, it is possible for people to change their habits. I hope. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think there is like, there is sort of a techno optimism of like, okay, well, we're going to have, um, <clears throat> automated vehicle vehicle soon. You're going to, it's going to take you to your location and then it's going to go and drive around. And this is how we're going to solve the parking problem. The, the car is actually not going to stay, uh still in the way that you know the cars today spend the vast majority of their time just sitting you know in a space doing nothing mm -hmm. um i suspect you're pretty skeptical of this techno optimism of of avs are going to solve the parking problem i don't know what to think anymore i don't think i'm the right person to ask about this uh you know when i started writing this book it was at a moment of i think peak hype for autonomous vehicles and then subsequently we we sunk into a trough of um um, nobody believing it was ever going to happen. And now I feel like we're on an upswing again. I have not been to Phoenix or San Francisco since the um, the big rollout of all these driverless cars, but it sounds like it's quite the thing to see. Um, I will say that, you know, the, the concept for listeners who aren't familiar with this, the concept that driverless cars could forever change the parking problem um, goes something like this. Parking costs money, but street space is free. And so if everyone has a driverless car, um, there is no reason that anybody would ever occupy a high cost parking space with that driverless car again. That driverless car would simply go and look for a cheaper uh, parking space out on the margins of the city or just drive around in circles all day um, until it was ready for its next task. So um, <laughs> obviously, if you imagine a city where all the cars are driverless and the road space remains free and uh, the parking remains, um, the parking costs money as it should because it's a, a you know, valuable uh, use of downtown real estate, um, you can see how this could present some some problems, right? But um, I think the uh, this situation is very speculative. <laughs> and um, I think also... Um, yeah, it, it it also depends on on ownership, right? I think ownership is a big part of this, and it, and insurance is probably a big part of this as well. Um, 
because if you know if you are getting let's say uh if all those cars are owned by fleets like you know uber or uh, or something like that and there is or waymo and there is no um personal car ownership as, as we know it today um then i think that that probably um changes the way this this rolls out. And I think the way that the the space is charged, whether that's through private insurance companies or through city or through whatever we come up with to replace the gas tax, like all those things could, could play into this as well. Yeah, right. Well, and I, I mean, I think like, even if, <clears throat> even if the technology ends up being there to where cars can do that, then I mean, you have a separate issue of just a dramatic increase in traffic congestion, which is going to require other changes, you know, like congestion pricing or on street parking mandate, you know, we're, we're not we're not getting around the issue of of some sort of change in parking management. Yeah, and that's uh, that right, and that's that's really important, right? And I think whatever happens um, going forward, right, we're facing two big challenges. Even if the AVs don't come to pass, we have the arrival of electric vehicles, and that is going to require a huge rethinking of um, how we approach parking. So, um, yeah, I think. Uh, we're a long way off from confronting the 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 AV issue AV issue as it pertains to parking, but you know the so I, yeah. I, but just to say one more thing about that, the prospect of reclaiming all this urban parking space for other uses because it becomes worthless as a parking asset is appealing, right? I mean that is a huge amount of land, um, and uh, and it's exciting to think that that could no longer be required for parking. At the same time, if all those cars that currently park um, subsequently begin to just drive everywhere instead of parking, then traffic nightmare. I mean, just going to be absolutely awful. And uh, and so I, I don't think that that's necessarily an entirely rosy situation for cities, even if it means we can build on a couple parking lots. Uh, you know, in uh, Chicago figures very heavily in the book, and I didn't know. I, I'd always heard about the Chicago case. You know, I I'll, I'll let you maybe describe in more detail what happened in Chicago. But essentially, Chicago, uh, as I understand, privatized all of its on-street parking in probably the most catastrophically foolish way possible. Um, and you talk a little bit about the fallout of that. But I think one of the sort of, I mean, among the many problems that this caused for the city. One of the things that it seems to have done is actually to force the city to think about on street parking management, maybe in a way that no other city in America is today. I, yeah, why don't you talk about the Chicago case for 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 folks who 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 might have not read the book yet? Well, in two thousand and eight, Chicago decided to privatize thirty six thousand of its uh, parking meters. In a 75-year deal, the city uh, leased these parking meters to a group of investors led by Morgan Stanley, and um, they received more than a billion dollars um, in exchange for 75 years of parking meter revenue. And at the time, um, this seemed to many on the Chicago City Council and uh, Mayor Richard Daley like it was potentially a, uh, a good deal. And one of the reasons for that is that the city took in barely any revenue in, in meter dollars, right? Because the meters had been the same price for decades. And so when they ran the numbers, um, it didn't seem like uh, such a terrible deal at all. Um, of course, anybody looking uh, at this for more than a moment could tell the reason that Morgan Stanley thought these meters were worth um, uh, more than a billion dollars over the course of the next 75 years was because they were going to raise the rates. And that's exactly what they did. They took over the meters at the start of 2009, and they subsequently raised the rates um, quite significantly um, in most of the city. And, uh, and, and the result of that was that um, they have already, uh, just 15 years into the deal, um, recouped all the money that they paid out for 75 years worth of parking meter revenue. And at this point, the rest is uh, just, uh, just that's, uh, they're in the bonus. Yeah, and so this, I mean, this is had a, just a number of issues. I mean, as I understand, it becomes very difficult then for the city to remove any on-street parking, right? So they can't build any bike or bus lanes, right? Without compensating Morgan Stanley. It's just, it's just very complicated because the terms of the contract are such that every time the city uh, removes a meter from circulation, they need to find a way to replace it with an equivalent meter. And since the streets are pretty much blanketed in commercial areas anyway, with parking meters already, it's not that easy to wipe out a, a couple big blocks of um, commercial parking meters 
and then find two additional unmetered commercial blocks where you can set up parking meters um, to compensate the uh, the concessionaires for what you're taking away from them. Now, um, yeah, so that obviously poses huge problems for what we think of as like progressive modern city street management. If you want to um, really any reason at all to close that curb, whether it's for a full-time BRT lane or a bike lane or a construction project, a farmer's market, whatever it is, um, you are on the hook to Morgan Stanley and the group of investors. But, you know, all this stuff has now been securitized and sold off. So I won't say Morgan Stanley. I'll say CPM LLC, which is the company that actually operates the parking meters. But you, you'd be on the hook as the city of Chicago to um, recoup them for those losses. Now, the way this actually happens in practice is enormously complicated and has been the subject of much um, negotiation between the, the city and the parking meter company. But the gist of it, yes, is that... Um, you know, they they act like every time you take a parking meter off the streets, you're taking away part of the money they were entitled to in the contract. And there's some truth to that. I, I'm curious, too, about how they price. I mean, I assume they're pricing around revenue maximization. I mean, the, the, I think the parking uh, managing or pricing for on-street parking management, generally you want to leave like two or three spaces open on every block. So you have a, you take away the distance of the crews and there's always a spot available, but the price might fluctuate. Uh, how are they pricing uh, the spaces? Like, are, are, I think you suggested that's, at one point that the price is really high and that there's a lot of vacancies. Yeah, that's true. And that's a, I'm really glad you asked that because I think when people hear about this deal, people who are um, schooled in the teachings of Don Shoup uh, hear about this deal and they say, well... Uh, that sounds great. Sounds like Chicago found religion, you know, maybe by accident, but they eventually figured it out that they actually have to charge a high price for um, street parking spaces. And um, that obviously misses an important component of the of, you know, good parking policy, which is that the money does not go into the pockets of Chicagoans, right? Like they've already that billion dollars is long gone. And at this point, um, every quarter they pay into that just goes directly to investors and um, and and will for the next 60 years. So that's a tough pill to swallow. Um, but the other part of it is that uh, as far as I can tell, the company doesn't have a very um, sophisticated way of either uh, of pricing the streets. I mean, they do not, for example, employ the kind of dynamic pricing that you would see in a place like um, Boulder, Colorado or Austin, Texas. I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, Boulder, Colorado or uh, San Francisco, which is the famous case of uh, a city charging, uh, alternating the, the the price of the meters, sometimes even block by block, um, depending on how popular that block is and how many people want to park there. So I've, I have not seen that in Chicago. Um, and the other thing is that uh, as far as I can tell, um, they partly as a result of this, the parking meter rates are really high and they seem to be set to um, take in a bunch of money at moments of peak demand. But um, otherwise, you end up with a lot of vacant spaces on these commercial corridors and absolutely jam-packed parking on all the free blocks that are um, a few blocks away. So um, the system is not what I would call well-managed. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's definitely a cautionary tale. I would say there are um, very few uh, silver linings for Shupistas in this, in this story. No, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, the, the, the book certainly... I mean, it provided a lot of context on it. And I think I think I'd had that initial intuition, too, of like, oh, OK, well, I guess they were forced by this incredibly foolish error to start pricing their parking. But, you know, I think that the, the details really, really matter. And you 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 kind of get into that. Um, you know, part of what's great about the book and, and this issue area, it, you, you capture a, a revolution that's happening in this space. Uh, you talk about the sort of bizarre cult of Donald Shoup uh, and the rise of groups like the Parking Reform Network. Um, you know, my, my first thought is why, you know, what is it about the character of Shoup that, that, that gets, you know, he's the lone professor so far as I'm aware, who has a cult around him and likely one of the only professors who has really started a national policy reform movement. What, do you, what is going on there? Oh boy. Well, I think, I mean, you know, I, the first thing that needs to be said about Donald Shoup for listeners who have not uh, encountered him or his work is that he is incredibly generous and, um, and incredibly supportive of people who want to engage in parking reform in any way, shape or form. And he's been just an indefatigable um, spokesperson for this issue. And uh, on a personal level, when I um, 
had the idea to write this book, one of the first things that I did was shoot him an email and say, um, you know, hi, Professor Shoup, what would you what would you think about such an idea? And he was um, immediately very, very enthusiastic and said he would do anything he could to help. And I ended up sitting in on um, some of his classes and uh, and and he has otherwise been um, a great supporter of my project, as I think he has been of pretty much anyone else who's been involved in this field over the last 20, 30 years. So um, a great deal of credit for that, I think, goes to his um, personal attitude towards this, because he certainly doesn't need to spend as much time with um, people working on these projects as he does. Um, but I think the other thing, right, is that he picked a topic that had, um, you know, he was really the, the right person at the right time for um, parking studies. And one of the interesting things, so I think many people who um, read uh, Don's work would have the impression that no one had ever thought about parking before Don came along. And I think that's true to an extent, but only after about 1950, because in the early part of the 20th century, there were actually a lot of people who recognized just how important it was to get the parking right and how you could really screw up a city by getting the parking wrong. And um, I think one of the things that happened in the 1950s and the 60s is we um, affected such a super abundance of parking in so many places um, that it actually sort of ceased to be something that uh, that occupied the attention of, you know, big time urban planners. Now, you could argue there were perhaps more important things to think about at that time, but um, one way or another, uh, it sort of, it really fell off the map. And so Don came along at a time when um, I think this whole body of research had, had basically been entirely forgotten. And, um, and not only that, but we had also, since that time, greatly changed the urban environment um, with the imposition of parking minimums. So there was this whole new thing to analyze, which obviously um, he did to great effect. So I think that's part of it as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I'm also just sort of broadly interested in, in because people don't seem to get casually into parking people people sort of get tuned into this issue and they become a little fanatical about it right i mean that you know and i think that's partly because of of of, of having a really effective uh cult leader so to speak with 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 don uh, but it, it, yeah i'm curious like wh why what do you think it is you know is it, it, it is it just the ever presence of parking is it what, what why why do you think people get so turned on to this issue i mean to the point where now we have a nationwide movement of people who are doing parking reform you know voluntarily <laughs> well i guess my i guess the obnoxious issue would be sorry the obnoxious answer to your question would be to say it's finally getting the attention it deserves since it occupies as much urban land as it does i mean this shouldn't be an overlooked question this should be like one of the central questions of how we design cities the question of where we store where how and um, how much we pay to store our automobiles is um as uh is incredibly important. <laughs> it's just a, it's just a huge, obviously a huge issue in a society where we all drive these these two you know two ton vehicles everywhere. So um, I think that that you know to some extent it's not surprising that people get onto it and then they can't unsee it um, since its use of real estate and its impact on architecture is so enormous. Um, but then again, I think an important thing that's happened here is that. Um, there's something so uh, attractively um, simple and concise and clear about Shupian parking directives. And I think it has that in common with the YIMBY movement. And I think there's a lot of overlap and that people are interested in one and the other because it just feels like there's this intractable societal problem. And then all of a sudden you stumble upon this concept. And in the case of the YIMBY movement, it would be that there's not enough housing. In the case of the parking reform movement, it would be that there's too much parking and it's too cheap. And those are pretty simple concepts to grasp. And you don't need a graduate degree in planning or economics to, to see those things. And so I think it makes an attractive point of entry for activists and people looking to get interested in politics, right? It's, it's not really a partisan issue. It doesn't feel like um, a particularly, I was gonna say particularly it shouldn't be a particularly fraud issue, but of course that, that would belie the actual um, uh, circumstances on the ground. But but I think for people who get into it, it can seem philosophically clear um, in a way that lots and lots of issues in society are very are complicated, right? And 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 parking reform um, often uh, does not feel that way. It feels like 
uh, <laughs> there's a lot of really low hanging fruit that you can get to. Um, and I would add, we have we've done so much damage to the urban environment. It it, it feels like um, feels like you can really get something done. You can make a change. You don't have to fiddle around the edges in this field um, to really make a pretty significant change in the way things get built, the way things look, the way people get around. Yeah, I, I, another shoopism that sticks with me. Uh, if you've got a question, parking is the answer, uh, right? I mean, I think that's part of it is that you, you go to these groups and folks come into this from a housing affordability perspective or from an environmental perspective or from a bicycling and transit equity perspective. So, I mean, there's a bunch of things that lead people back. One of the things, another, another aspect of your book that, that was really interesting to me was uh, a little bit more discussion of the parking industry. You spend a lot of time talking to people who manage parking garages, uh, uh, you know, folks who are trying to use apps to better optimize parking. Um, yeah, I, I'm curious to get your general thoughts on the parking industry, but I'm, I'm especially curious, you know, how are they how are they responding to this like newly sort of popular interest in parking? Like, cause I mean, all of these, I, I, a lot of these people that you talk to, they're like, yeah, parking was either like, to the extent people thought about like the parking industry, it was had to do with like corruption and it's this profoundly unsexy industry. And now it's this thing that like, Hey, we're on a podcast discussing it. And a few hundred people at least are going to listen to it and be thinking about it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I did do a parking industry podcast um, earlier this year and it was great. I think, um, uh, and I and I also actually recently heard from a, um, a parking garage developer, you know, real estate, you know, parking garage owner, I should say, in um, in in Philadelphia. Manager would be the right way to put it, right? They these guys mostly don't own garages; they manage them on behalf of offices and condos that are that are forced to build them. And um, and he said uh, he said he saw my book at Barnes and Noble, which I thought. Like really, nobody nobody told you, <laughs> but uh, I don't think uh, I don't think a lot of these guys um, are very up to date on what is happening in like with strong towns, with shoot, with parking reform. Like they are very much in their own world, thinking about um, parking tech and uh, you know parking taxes and all this other stuff. Um, that said, like uh, they are obviously car people, but Funnily enough, I think there is some common ground between them and um, people who get into parking reform because they're interested in creating, you know, a more bikeable, walkable, less car dependent city. And that is that um, they recognize that it costs a lot of money to build parking. And um, that is a tier of insight that I think few people have, which is why a lot of people's reaction when you talk about parking minimums is just to say simply, uh, well, why? Like, wouldn't it be better if all these apartments did come with parking? Uh, seems like a no brainer. And I think the parking reform, uh, excuse me, the parking garage magnate guys, they, they get this, right. They get that it costs a lot of money to build parking. They get that it's a huge imposition on every project. And, uh, perhaps, uh, also, uh, out of some sense of self-interest, they recognize that free street parking um, is not the best policy. Now you could say, well, of course they want the street parking to cost money. Yes, um, they they do have they do have an interest in that. Um, but other than that, I think they you know they have a, they have a fairly good grasp of the field, despite you know some of them have actually never heard of Donald Trump. Hmm. Appalling. Um, yeah, I mean, right. It, 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 if I was a parking garage manager, of course, it's, to my mind, I would think I would be pretty committed to uh, getting on street parking priced and uh, that, that seems to be my number one competitor but i mean it's the same type of thing you hear with yimby where folks i think have this idea uh, you, know, you occasionally hear this theory articulated of like oh, okay incumbent developers might not want more housing to get built on the idea that um you know it'll increase the value of their assets maybe if they're managing apartments and i don't think a lot of people think about these issues on 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 that level uh necessarily but it, uh, in, in any case it's good to hear that that, that the, the parking industry folks are starting to bump into these issues now, even if only randomly finding your book at uh, Barnes and Noble. Um, I will say that what the point at which they, uh, they don't, the point at which I think they start to operate at cross purposes is that their number one issue is garage taxes, which are huge, huge it's a huge amount of money. And <laughs> cities uh, reason that they can, um, it's actually now that I'm thinking about it, it is a bit of a bad policy. I mean, cities charge a lot in garage taxes, and the reason they do that is because, well, the, you know, the reason they do that is because it's perceived as a way 
to make money off um, a service that doesn't seem particularly useful and that they don't really have an interest in uh, encouraging more of it, right? So as opposed to like putting a giant tax on like restaurants or something like that or um, any other business. So, um, so that's why they do it. But at the same time, it seems like uh, cities are really happy to raise garage taxes in a way that they will never raise meter rates. And um, that seems wrong to me. <laughs> that seems like the seems a bit of a backward policy. And if you were to take that pot of city revenue that comes from garage taxes and ask, could we instead generate this money um, through meter revenues and lower garage taxes? Um, then that would be a way to, you know, push more long-term drivers into garages and free up more space on the street. Um, so I know we're all focused on raising meter revenue, um, but it does seem like a flip side of that coin is that commercially owned garages tend to be quite expensive. They cost a lot more than meters. And that's not just because the meters are underpriced, but it's also because the garages are so heavily taxed. Yeah, I mean, I guess that the... the politically it seems obvious right the tax on the garage is mediated you're going to tax the garage and then that person will maybe potentially increase their prices but it's not going to be a clear like i think the average consumer is not going to see oh okay a policy change happened and now i'm paying more and the way with meters where it's like okay the meters publicly owned it's a public authority that that increased this cost i mean i think this is where you know another aspect of sort of shupista theory is important which is you, ha you have to take that parking revenue and then immediately turn it into community benefits that people see. So they like understand, okay, yeah, it's it's annoying to me that I had to pay 25 cents extra, but they just planted a row of trees on the street. They just repaved the sidewalks. They just repaved the, the street so I can tolerate it, right? Um, and I mean, this is a, this is like, a part, this is, I think, a key area where what's happened in Chicago would diverge from from this theory of, you know, you you make people comfortable with on-street parking pricing by showing a clear benefit of it. And I think this is partly what, in answer, you know, to a previous question, is like, I think this is what people get so radicalized about with this issue area is how much money we just leave on the table uh, with, with parking, so to speak. How much public revenue just gets sort of wasted uh, by not pricing on-street parking. That's a great point. I usually break it down uh, in terms of the the motivating elements of reform. I usually break it down into two um, uh, groups, and 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 one of them is like more focused on um, questions of housing and uh, housing affordability and housing typology and the fact that by requiring parking, we've lost out on um, so much uh, quote unquote missing middle housing. And um, I think that's a very uh, that's a big reason for reform. That's one of the big issues that gets people into this. It seems like really, um, uh, you know, there's going to be some you know, maybe difficult questions down the road about how to build enough um, super affordable housing, about how to um, sufficiently upzone the city in a way that feels equitable. All Okay, fine. Uh, parking reform feels like an obvious one, right? So I think that's that's one of them. And the other one is transit, right? And transportation, because... Um, it's really clear that the more parking we build, the more people drive and transportation is the country's largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. And driving is also the source of a bunch of other local level externalities, such as <clears throat> traffic congestion and car crashes and injuries and fatalities and all that. And so those are the two issues I usually think of, but it's true that at a more rarefied tier of insight, you could look at this simply as a matter of good governance, right? And say, you know, there's, yeah, as you say, all this money that we could potentially be generating for public improvements um, that we're not. And it's not even like we're not generating that money because uh, we're creating some other benefit somewhere else. We're not generating that money. And, and as a result, people are driving around in circles looking for parking spaces. Well, this is another thing that you touch on in the book, it, the intersection of parking and housing, just the extent to which parking requirements uh just shape the built form of our environment of course and, and even just beyond uh parking lots in front of strip malls right i mean i live in a uh, a dingbat in la which for those who don't know is a two-story multifamily building built in the 50s and 60s in los angeles and it's essentially a building typology completely optimized around this you know 10-year requirement that new multifamily had to have covered parking right or the you know uh, i think uh, they call it the, the dallas donut right the five over one building that's surrounding a parking garage i mean, this is something i think that 
it's another thing. It's like it's almost like there's this they live quality to the issue where it's like you start to understand parking mandates and then you start to look around your environment and you're like, oh, this is this is why my neighborhood looks the way it does. Uh, and, 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 you know, in many cases, uh, as, as you as you're getting at that, this is why it's potentially quite expensive to live in some of these areas. Parking is not cheap. It's not free. Yeah, what I I mean, I think it is an architectural revelation. Uh, I just and it hits me anew, honestly. I every time I go to another city, I just came back from Denver, Colorado, and uh, Denver has some enormous new buildings downtown that are uh, just prime examples of the parking podium style, where the first like four, six, eight, ten stories of the building will just be garage, and then above that will be the actual building building, and <laughs> that's both. It's both ugly and they they do make an attempt sometimes to disguise the garage so you can't see what it is. Um, but it's also such a great visual illustration of how much space is required for parking, right? I mean, it can be abstract when we say that like, you know, restaurants trigger parking requirements that create a situation where you're actually building more space for parking than you are for restaurant. And then you look at these buildings and it's like, oh, I get it. <laughs> it's suddenly It's suddenly so apparent. I mean, we can obviously do this with... Uh, satellite images as well and looked out on um, you know commercial um, districts in in the suburbs but um, but it's always dramatic when you when you see it in in real life on a downtown um, parking garage and, and also I was recently in in Santa Fe and uh, Santa Fe is known as this uh, you know little jewel box of um, southwestern adobe architecture and uh, there too, I found uh, an incredibly elegant contextual parking garage that made up the bottom two floors of uh, the space directly across from the cathedral. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, we, yeah, we we try to hide it. I mean, at the same time, it's like, I I think when I think about parking, something that always springs to my mind is the the that Reddit post of. Uh, ask historians and the the question was um what did roman parking lots look like right uh and this is you know this like skyrocketed to the front page because it it was such an amusing and and very innocent question of this person just assumed like well yeah of course cities have always required uh large parking lots right and this, this person had just very innocently asked like well okay what did that look like in ancient uh ancient rome <laughs> yeah that 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 is a funny question i have read um that there was there there may have been some Roman policy on on chariot movement, but probably nothing um, resembling our modern parking lots. I mean, even up until the 19th century, um, wealthy people often did not use horses and buggies to get around, precisely because the challenge of um, parking them in a downtown would become so challenging, um, and so it was more attractive to um, you know use public transit or something like that. So I think that's that's always been a part of the it's always been a part of the urban question is how do you store the implements of transportation? Um, and that's the nicest thing I'll say about that. But it is true that like, if you grew up in 20th or 21st century America, it does seem very natural to you um, that every land use has this kind of five o'clock shadow, not even five o'clock shadow. It's like a full lumberjack beard of, uh, of parking that's directly adjacent to it. Beautiful. Well done. Yes. Um, <laughs> I well, so I, a couple of things that I, I've been thinking about lately that I want to I want to get your thoughts on. You know, I think something that's happening in many U.S. cities, right? Very high office vacancy rates. I had sort of my assumption had been okay, that's going to bounce back, but it does seem like we might just have a permanent shi permanent shift in office demand. Mm -hmm. And there's discussion of okay, office to residential conversions, but I think there's another question of well, what do we do with all these parking garages? And I think there's this notion of maybe we can convert garages. Uh, into residential uses potentially. I was just talking to a developer, and she was saying, "Yeah, we're doing we're doing flat floors for all of our parking garages going forward, on the assumption that you know in the near future we might convert them uh, over to some other use." Have you seen a lot of that happening? What do you what do you think about that? I have not seen a lot of garage to residential conversion. What I've heard on this subject is that while it sounds nice to say. Well, this is a garage, but it might be an apartment building later, and it definitely sounds like green and um, and good for the housing picture and all that. Um, it's just not that easy, and it's sort of expensive, and so it really happens. And additionally, actually, a funny thing is a lot of garages are built with lower load-bearing weights than residential buildings, which seems counterintuitive because you would think, what could be heavier than storing a bunch of cars? 
but actually turns out storing a bunch of apartments is heavier than storing a bunch of cars. And so you um, sometimes need to provide structural reinforcements to get those garages ready um, to hold uh, actual buildings. Um, but I think, I, I don't disagree though, that the empty garages present an opportunity, but I would think of it rather as an opportunity to simply build new housing, right? Immediately adjacent. And my preference would be rather than trying to um, convert, we take advantage of this moment and rather than waiting around for people who are going to convert them, we take advantage of this empty garage moment to say, now is the time to build a ton of new housing without parking in these urban areas where we have this huge surplus of parking spaces, especially overnight. And there has long been a tradition of downtown developers taking advantage of this situation where even prior to remote work, you had all these garages that were full during the day and empty at night. I mean, when Shoup and Michael Manville studied the adaptive reuse ordinance in downtown Los Angeles, which permitted developers to transform these old commercial buildings into residences um, without providing additional parking, one of the things they found was that people still did come with their cars. It's just that they stored them in commercial garages, which had typically which had long been this feature of downtown LA, but hadn't really been thought of as an asset that could be leveraged in this way um, to permit um, parking-free development. But I think that's a situation in which a lot of American downtowns find themselves in right now with a surplus of parking, especially overnight, and to think more flexibly about parking requirements. And in many cases, it's not even about the requirements anymore because a lot of these downtowns don't have requirements anymore um, at this point. And so it's really incumbent, I think, on developers, maybe the local city council person, et cetera, to say, we actually should try and build these places with less parking because we have a parking surplus. And if we can take advantage of that resource, then we can um, save money on the housing. And then at some future point, we'll wind up with a denser and less car-centric downtown with cheaper units of housing. Right. Here, here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, I will say, I think one area where we've seen a lot of uh, parking to housing conversions is with ADUs. I mean, that's like accessory dwelling units here. You have a great chapter on this on how we came to live in and above the garage. Um, but the, part of what has been key to the success of accessory dwelling units in California is that we made it very, very easy for people to convert their garages uh, into ADUs. And we've seen many tens of thousands of units work out like that. But yeah, I, 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 I would love to see this work for maybe full scale parking garages or parking ramps but uh yeah i i hadn't that was i hadn't known about the load bearing issue so that that's that's actually the opposite of what i would expected um you know i mean one of the challenges that we face is here in california you you mentioned most downtowns now have eliminated their parking requirement uh which is good uh we need to have citywide elimination but we're working on that as the parking reform network people say citywide all uses no parking requirements um here in California, we have eliminated parking requirements within a half mile of transit. But something that I regularly encounter is even if you have a developer who's like, yeah, I think I can build a building with maybe a 0.5 parking space to unit ratio, uh, it's often hard to get it a bank to make underwrite the loan for that project. They're on the assumption of, oh, well, you're not going to be able to sell or lease out these units unless you have one parking space per unit. Um, do you see any change happening there? Do we need to like go to, you know, like, banking conferences and start spreading the gospel about parking reform? Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I um, I think it I think it is changing. I mean, you hear these horror stories from developers in the old days about how like they actually had to travel across state lines to get financing for projects without parking. And I think there are places in which this seems to be um, becoming normalized. Um, like you look at all the development that's happening in places like Seattle or Chicago, that's not corresponding to the old parking requirements. I mean, I think that's, that's a very, um, positive sign. And I think the key thing with banks is like banks are conservative, right? So they, they don't want to push the envelope or try some sort of experiment in urbanism, um, that they're going to be on the hook for when the project gets foreclosed. But the flip side of that is that banks are also, um, interested in comparables. And if you can provide them with 10 fully leased apartment buildings with zero parking spaces that are within two miles of the project you're building, then that's pretty strong evidence that you have a model that's going to work. And um, somebody had to go first, but uh, at this point in a lot of cities, um, there are a number of compelling examples of, of how this can work. So I think that's that's a good sign. 
Yeah, I mean, I think one way that a lot of parking reformers approach this is they say, well, let's just impose parking maximums. Do um, you have a lot of thoughts on that? I mean, I don't know if parking min I don't know if parking maximums would set a bank at ease. If the bank is concerned that the project is not viable, I'm not sure how helpful it is to say, but the city code won't let us build it any other way. And, um, and, and then the bank might just say, well, maybe you should build in a different city because we don't think this project makes any sense. Um, so uh, I think parking maximums could be a pretty valuable tool in places where um, the cost of housing has become really, really high. Because at a certain point, um, you reach a point where developers stop trying to maximize the number of units they can build and minimize the parking because the parking is considered a cost center. And you reach a point where the parking gets to be considered a luxury amenity and all the families come with two cars and they want one kid, one car, one space plus for the nanny or whatever. And, um, and in those places, uh, they actually tend to be some of the most central and walkable places. So like part of the tragedy of parking reform is I feel like we came the, the, as a society late enough to this subject that even in a place like Manhattan, which now uh, hasn't had parking maximums for some time, you still get brand new luxury projects that include a bunch of parking because they recognize that actually the cost of the retail cost of a parking space in Manhattan is greater uh, than the cost to build that parking space. And Manhattan may be one of the few places in the country where this is true. Probably also applies to like Back Bay and parts of San Francisco. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's true that once people are willing to pay hundred thousand dollars for a parking space, then suddenly those insane construction costs associated with parking, um, you know, the the pro forma begins to turn the other way, and there's an incentive to uh, create more parking, and that's not good. Not just because um, it's not because we're anti parking, uh, it's because parking creates more traffic. And so if you're operating in a really dense urban environment that's already choked with cars like New York or Boston or San Francisco, um, you should want to stop more parking from being built because it's going to mean um, if you're uh, less traffic taking up the streets. And I think uh, maybe a kind of funny reason also why you should support this policy is that if parking is considered a luxury amenity that raises the cost of the real estate, well, um, it ought to be in your interest that to, to just not have that happen. <laughs> like it's a really easy way to, to sort of limit the kind of ultra ultra luxury um, construction market and push that back down into regions that are more affordable to people with normal jobs um, without feeling like you're, you know, regulating amenities in some draconian way, like prohibiting hot tubs or, uh, you know, r rooftop yoga studios or something like that so i think that's all good i mean i think the downside is obviously you lose a little bit of the rhetorical um the rhetorical fire that's associated with you know classic shupian getting rid of minimum parking reform and i think that there's a very appealing side of that too which is to say what could be a more asinine use of government power than to tell me to build parking spaces and i think that's a very powerful argument for getting rid of parking minimums and once you start replacing them with maximums that becomes a little more complicated yeah, I mean that that that's maybe I'm just too committed to the to the rhetoric of the issue, but that is something that I think you know it's a very effective line to, that I think shootbeasts and parking reformers have deployed, which is, well, we don't know how much parking is appropriate at any given spot, so just get rid of the minimums. But then if you turn around and start saying you know we should adopt maximums, that would I think that kind of contradicts that earlier point. I mean that it suggests said, you do know, right? It suggests the government actually does know how much parking. That's right. Be. That's right. Yeah. And, 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 but, and I don't want to give away that line because I think it's a very powerful line and actually has some appeal for, for more moderate or more conservative uh, policymakers. Um, but I, I mean, I, to my mind, it's clear that there are many environments where excess parking has a negative externality, right? I mean, parking, it, it's so funny because you, you'll have, you'll have projects being proposed and people will say, I'm opposed to this project. It's going to generate too much traffic. And also it doesn't have enough parking. Right. Um, you know, p parking generates traffic, which is kind of this 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 nuisance. And so I think that there's, I think there's a good argument for having maybe a per stall fee uh, to internalize some of the, you know, the potential externality of each additional parking space. And I wonder if like, that's maybe the approach to solving the problem rather than just a flat maximum, because then that creates revenue for the developer that insists, no, actually, I do need these spaces, and I'm willing to pay the fee that creates revenue that can then be invested in alternatives.
That's an interesting idea. I haven't um, heard of it being proposed, but yeah, it seems feasible. I, you know, one other place I was thinking about this recently was I was talking to um, a city planner from Bogota, from Colombia, and she was saying they have uh, maximums in some place and minimums in others. I was like, what? It's like, how do, they, how do you wrap your mind around that? But it was, it was precisely this, right? You got some neighborhoods that are uh, really isolated from transit where developers are just throwing up all kinds of super dense projects with no parking and the street is chaos and that's where they want their minimums and um, other places are transit rich and also just rich rich and they don't want any more parking and so they have maximums. Um, I guess the, the downside to um, slapping a fee on it is is just uh, one more um, one more complicated variable in the development process. But, but again, like if we're thinking about things to tax, uh, new private parking in luxury condo buildings is pretty much like the <laughs> seems to me like exactly the kind of thing that you would want to slap a tax on. So it's I not, endorse it's this not... policy. It's not quite a tax on foreigners living abroad, um, but I think it's something that in urban environments, people might be sympathetic toward. Um, I'm going to ask a question and, and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit so you can you can think about it. I'm curious if you changed your mind on anything while writing the book. Uh, you've been you've been writing on this issue. I mean, you're you're, you're one of my favorite writers on zoning and, and housing and transportation issues. So you've been writing and chewing on this stuff for a while. But I'm curious if, you know, when you sat down to write the book. Is there something where you you actually shifted your perspective on something substantive? I think that the real moment of reckoning for me has actually come since the book has been published because I have spent so much time now talking to people about the parking issues in their city. I mean, I think I've probably been to a dozen places and that's just where I've actually been and then done interviews with, with lots more. And the question always comes up, well, in our city, X and Y and Z, and, um, you know, <laughs> it's just a very uh, complicated and locally tailored issue to deal with the politics of this question. And I think I underestimated the extent to which you could just say, look at how selfish you're being. Why don't you permit new people to live in your neighborhood and forget about the parking situation and that just doesn't cut it and um and it gets it gets really complicated when you think about how are we actually going to manage spillover parking in places where the density has arrived and lots of people are parking on the street but transit amenity access job access hasn't quite come along to the point where people don't own cars and so um that's a really thorny question and i you know, to some extent, it's a it's a blessing to to be even getting there, to be even having neighborhoods in this country that um, that exist at that density. Um, but you do hear from people that you know, I've lived in this neighborhood for a long time. I I depend on parking my car on the street. I need my car to get to work. I can't afford a garage, and um, and I think it does get a little bit complicated to say how are we gonna how are we gonna deal with that. Um, and so it's not a it's not necessarily a question that I feel like I should have taken on in the book, but it's true that when people ask me, okay, what now? You know, I heard this from somebody in like over the Rhine in Cincinnati, and I've heard this from Philadelphia as well. It's like there actually is a severe um, parking shortage now on the street, and it's it's just not feasible, unfortunately, to say, well, it's time to charge for it. Because I think the, the politics of this issue are uh, really, really um complicated and even people who recognize i think that the status quo is messed up you know pitting new housing against the neighbors existing parking and asking like you know you have to choose between one or the other um even people who recognize that the status quo is messed up don't necessarily want to change it because it feels like changing it might have these unforeseen consequences forcing people to pay for parking coming up with a new permit system um getting rid of minimums altogether in cities that aren't there yet and to me, it feels a bit like the trolley problem, where they can assess that the trolley, um, it's actually a gigantic uh, Cadillac Escalade, is on the wrong track. Um, <laughs> and they they sense that, right? They sense that it's like auto-dependence for all uh, ugly buildings, high cost of housing, etc. But if they're going to be the one responsible for s turning that steering wheel and putting that Cadillac, Cadillac Escalade on a different track... Um, they know they're going to be responsible for the consequences of that policy change. And so that does inject a kind of 
um, conservatism into the political status quo in cities that are contemplating these changes. Yeah, I mean, so many great points there. One, I just want to say Over the Rhine is one of my favorite neighborhoods in the U.S. Crazy underrated, uh, uh, beautiful, walkable urbanism, very close to my hometown of Lexington. Um, second, I mean, I think that's exactly right. I, I When I was a planner in Queens, you, you know, I, I'd be working as, as the planner managing the application for a new building. And folks would say, well, like, how can this how can you allow this building that's not like fully parked? Uh, the, I can barely find a, a space on my street today. And it's like, well, of course, the like the easy answer is like, oh, yeah, well, we should do like on street parking management on your street. And like then that problem goes away. Um, but, you know, a we don't always do these things in tandem. And B, even if we do do them, that's a transition that's difficult for people and would force that person to maybe change the way they live their lives. And, and it, that might ultimately be for the better. But that's a it's just hard to do these things in, in, in tandem. And I mean, that's I think you're you're making a really important point here, which is there's a reason why, you know, a suboptimal equilibrium persists, right? Because it's just, it's the way things are today. And as bad as it is, right? Transitioning to maybe something better is is just inherently difficult. I, I think you're right that people don't fully it's, appreciate that. It's, it's exactly that. It's the difference between what would have been the right way to design this policy and how do we get there from where we are now? And um, I think, that second question is challenging in um, neighborhoods that are low income, car dependent, severe housing shortage, all these things adding up. And in the long run, you might say, look, if you're somebody who's going to depend on a car and you don't have enough money to park it for free, um, then in, in the long term, um, excuse me, to park it in a garage or, or pay to park on the street, then in the long run, you know, this might not be the neighborhood that is best suited for your your profile, right? But that's not that's not something that a planner can say. And obviously nobody wants to upend the social geography of a neighborhood by charging for parking. And I'm not sure that that would actually happen, but, you know, um, but it is, it is a concern. And so I think that, you know, um, as I was saying, yeah, like the perfect policy is easy to see, but, but getting there might be challenging. Well, I mean, I, I think, I, like you said at the top of the conversation, right, imagine that person who's just been in a neighborhood and they've lived a certain way and they maybe got used to parking, you know, and not paying anything for it on the street and density and 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 population growth, you know, healthy good things for a city force them to change the way they uh the way they get around and I to my mind it's very callous to say to that person who's maybe been there 20 or 30 years, well, sorry, you know, like maybe you should move to another neighborhood, right? Uh, you know, I think I I don't know, you know, I'm 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 sure it's sort of a bit of like unreasonable intuitive ethics, but we have this feeling of like, well, yeah, you've been there, right? It is kind of crummy to tell this person the community's changing and now we're gonna impose this this uh on street parking pricing. And that's where I think you have to go above and beyond to show them uh, folks like that, well, if we're gonna transition over to this, there's gonna be very clear benefits for you, even if you're one of the people who has to reluctantly sell your car, right? That we're going to be upgrading the bus service, we're gonna be up, you know, planting the street trees, we're gonna be do funding the public art projects. You know, you have to go above and beyond to convince that person that we're not just punishing you and kicking you out of your car. We're we're making a transition that uh, improves your quality of life. It, it's funny because it so closely imitates the Yimby NIMBY paradigm where you feel like people who have lived in places for, for a long time have this sense of what the neighborhood should be like and, and how it, that it sort of belongs to them and they get to make these decisions about whether there's rental housing or not. And um, you have to go in there and say, you know what? city's got to grow. We don't want people living out in the middle of the sprawl. You have an obligation to share these public resources that you've been lucky enough to um, live next to for so long. Um, but in the case of parking, it's such a kind of like uh, diminished version of that battle because the thing that people are claiming ownership over is so measly, right? <laughs> and so inexpensive. And so um, it's, it's, and that makes it more complicated, right? Because it's easy to say, well, um, screw you to somebody who lives in a $2 million house and doesn't want like housing for seniors being built four blocks away. Um, but it's definitely harder um, when you're telling somebody on a, on a congested block that we're going to take away their parking. Not that this actually happens, by the way. I mean, <laughs> I think to some extent where this is a kind of speculative scenario, but it is true that in neighborhoods that are seeing lots of housing growth and um, and where parking minimums have gone away, that like this is going to become an issue that we have to deal with uh, 
going forward. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 you know, I think the, the Machiavellian solution to this is to just institutionalize the practices that we've all been accustomed to and say, if you've lived here for a long time, then we're going to grandfather you into some special parking permit system. And you're going to be entitled to something that the newcomers don't get. And I think that's in some ways very unappealing in a democratic sense, because why should somebody who's lived in a neighborhood have ownership over the public right of way that a new resident can't have access to? On the other hand, I could I could see the argument being made that that's a fair way to deal with this process. And um, politically, perhaps it's the most pragmatic way to assuage people's concern about new housing is to say, we're going to let new neighbors live in your neighborhood, but don't worry, they're not going to take your parking. And does that, that does sometimes feel like caving into people's worst instincts. But if that's what it takes to get housing built, then maybe that's what's necessary. I, I think all of that's exactly right. I mean, here in Los Angeles, right, we we um, we have uh, most low density single family areas have residential permit passes and these streets are pretty massively under parked. Um, and in a certain sense, like this is just a transparently like bad, um, an inequitable arrangement. On the other hand, it probably helps to mediate, op mitigate opposition to multifamily developments nearby, right? Because now that person says, well, there's, even if the new apartment building comes in, I'm going to have my guaranteed parking space. And, um, yeah, I I'm, I'm with you, you know, on the one hand, it's like, great. We've, we've resolved some potential opposition to new housing, but boy, we did it by locking in this really inequitable sort of status quo. Um, I mean, to, maybe to put a bow on this conversation though, I, I think th this transitions are hard, but I think you and I would agree, like these are transitions that we, we kind of have to undertake. And this is where it's just, it's on planners and policy entrepreneurs and elected officials and activists to sort of come up with the most you know equitable workable ways to to make that transition the, i because i think the, the easy solution here is to say okay and this is what most jurisdictions do as you know is okay this issue's hard i'm not touching parking like i'm we're not doing anything with parking right and yeah yeah, yeah i think that's a great point and i don't mean for all these caveats to undermine um the urgency of the situation as it concerns housing affordability and um barriers to access and safe streets and all this stuff is really important. Um, but uh, one of the things I've noticed is that as much enthusiasm as there is around getting rid of parking minimums, and we've seen enormous progress on this issue, and it's really heartening, it has not been accompanied by a concurrent rethinking about street space and how streets work. And this is a big part of it, right? Because it's not magic that if you build less parking, people own fewer cars. There is a correlation there, but the real path to lowering the car ownership and taking the, um, you know, taking the teeth out of this crazy fight we have about parking spaces is creating environments where people don't need to drive as much. And so far, uh, what I see is municipalities being pretty open to the idea that parking minimums are no longer such a good idea. But then suddenly when it comes to like, reducing the number of lanes on a major thoroughfare to build like a BRT or a safe mobility lane for people, then all that enthusiasm for policy change goes out the window. And if you do one without the other, you're going to have a pretty nasty backlash when the neighborhood fills out. Another shoopism here, uh, parking is a fertility drug uh, for, for, for cars and driving, right? Um, yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is, I think this is, this is part of that point we we're getting at of like you have to it's not enough to just be pricing on street parking it also has to be we have to be using that 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 revenue to invest in alternatives to to, to car ownership and car dependence um yeah it's it's tough but i mean we are seeing I, and you highlight this in the book we are seeing a lot of 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 planners and policymakers and activists sort of take this on and and do this you know undertake the hard work of doing these things all at the same time so it, it is happening and i think ultimately your book sort of closes on a positive note of we are we are seeing I think as as bad as the current situation with parking policy is today things are getting better at kind of a remarkable clip I mean if you had said to me you know uh five years ago that you know dozens of cities and by 2023 would have almost completely if not completely eliminated parking requirements I would have thought well you know that's very optimistic but uh you know I, I have some bad news about the pace of policy change and yet here we are seeing it right I mean and states and major cities across the country, parking requirements are on the way out.
Yeah, I agree with you. It's a, it's a moment of great optimism and change that um, I'm curious what, what Don would say about it. I think he would probably say, well, um, couldn't have happened soon enough. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, but I think the there's, there's obviously, um, it, it's very exciting. I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't want to sell it short. It is, it is really, really exciting. And I think, um, I just, I just think that the, uh, the streets, the streets changes need to catch up to the land use changes. And that's, that's like a really important piece of this puzzle. Um, and for whatever reason, I think because parking minimums is a sort of, change to the city code that at the moment that change is made actually does nothing. There is no visible change, right? It's only in the years to come that you begin to see the effects of that um, take take shape. And that is obviously not true with taking a bunch of street parking spaces away to build a bike lane. And that, I'm um, sorry to say, remains a process that you know, when Mayor San Diego tried to build a bike lane, some local business owner told him he had blood on his hands. And that's the kind of rhetoric you see in city after city after city trying to make these changes. So um, I hope we find a way to uh, to get it together and uh, and get those things done. Yes, yes. Uh, dramatic language. Um, Henry, so what's next for you? What's what's next on the I, I'm sure you're doing a lot of book talks and events right now, but uh, what's what's next? Well, Nolan, I am back in school. I am a Loeb Fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And um, after spending so many years like flitting from story to story to story every three days and calling people um, and then ultimately like putting out these pieces into the world, it feels pretty good to just sit here and learn things. Like I feel like I'm just taking things in instead of putting them out in the world. And that's, that's nice. So I'm um, taking a little hiatus from writing and uh, basking in um, this wonderful uh, upsurge in interest in parking reform and uh, happy to talk to anybody about that anytime. Well, you've definitely deserved it. And I'm sure that it's all, uh, uh, you know, a writer never changes. I'm sure you're, you're getting a lot of uh, new grist for the mill here and, and future stories and, and hopefully future books. Um, uh, yeah, the book is Paved Paradise, How Parking Explains the World. Maybe the sequel will expand to the universe. Uh, strongly, strongly encourage folks to pick it up, even you know if you're new to the issue of parking or if you spend all day every day thinking about parking like me. It's got something for everybody. Uh, Henry, thanks for writing it and thanks for coming on Abundance. Thanks very much, Nolan. We'll get complete streets policy on Mars. <laughs> very good.